Hey everyone, this is Malka Asad and welcome back to the second episode of Dr. Panos' experience matching into neurosurgery. In the first episode, we talked about the medical school experiences and USMLE step scores and how important are these for matching into neurosurgery. In this episode, we'll talk about electives, clinical rotations, and the different pathways that applicants can take to match into neurosurgery. Dr. Panos, I would like to start by asking about the electives. Electives are extremely important when applying, especially for surgical specialties. Did you have the chance to do any hands-on clinical rotations in the U.S. prior to graduation? That's a very good question, and I think that's one of the most important reasons. Uh, one of the most important reasons to try to take also step one as early as possible, uh, which is a lot of the programs now. Um, and I don't know how things are going to play out, you know, with COVID. But you know, fortunately, the pandemic will slowly, you know, go away, especially now with vaccination and you know more protective, um, you know, kind of an, you know environment and uh, philosophy that would you know everybody's trying to adopt. But essentially. Um, a lot of the programs, including Mayo, uh, need a step one score um, in order to, you know, to offer you, you know, um, when you apply for an elective and to accept you. Some programs, including Mayo, also want a certification of your um, English proficiency. Um, and so I had to take TOEFL. Um, I'm not familiar with um, other programs, but I'm sure, you know, some other programs have similar, you know, requirements. Um, and so I think, you know, step one is definitely, you know, the, the sooner you take it, or as I said, uh, the more likely is, you know, because you, you also want to start, you know, kind of clinical experience in the U.S. with a form of whether it's, you know, like what is called an elective or a Zambi internship or an observership. I think it's critical for, um, for several main reasons. And I can list them now if you want. The first important reason is to come to the United States and see the systems yourself, right? You ultimately gonna decide for the rest of, you know, if you wanna, you know, be through, you know, go through the process and decide on whether you're gonna pursue residency in the United States only if you get into the system, okay? And you start, you know, essentially um, interacting with the, you know, the medical personnel, with, you know, allied health staff and with the patients. Okay, you may decide, you know, I've had some friends that decided that, you know, that this is not something they want to pursue for many reasons, for cultural, economical, you know, economic, financial, or for lifestyle reasons. They do not want to come to the United States. The second reason is because you want to, um, you know, make connections, um, you know, and get good letters of recommendation. And we will talk more about the letters um, later on in, the, uh, in our discussion. And the third one is, um, I think, for a competitive specialty like neurosurgery, um, I can talk more a little bit about kind of the different pathways, um, but essentially, um, I think it's very important to make connections uh, for research. So you're going to meet people that, you know, you're going to go back home, you're going to graduate, and then ultimately the question is what happens now? And I think, you know, getting to know some people that you can, you know, come later on, you know, move, move to the United States and, you know, start doing research like I did, like, you know, like you doing, Malka. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. And I like how you, you're saying every step is uh, leading to the next step one, leading to electives, yeah. leading to research. So now we can discuss research. You mentioned that you worked uh, in a lab for several years. How did you get into this research position? How mm -hmm. important is research for competitive specialties like neurosurgery? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, I'm going to take this opportunity to kind of lay down um, some of the pathways mm -hmm. that can, you know, help you nothing is going to be a guarantee i think it's just a matter of different pathways that people can take depending on their personality depending on their financial uh you know secure uh depending on their you know lifestyle preferences or depending on you know kind of the whole you know environment they grew up with and kind of the obstacles they have had in you know in their life and you know how things have changed um because they tried to you know uh, you know, move things along that way. But essentially, you know, the first pathway, which I think it's, you know, the most common one, and in my opinion, is the one that is has the highest chances. And I'm going to speak essentially with statistics now and probabilities, because I think, you know, the numbers don't lie. And so um, sure. the way I had it in my mind was, you know, what are the, what are the, what do the statistics say? say? So I think, and especially that's why it's also very helpful. I would always encourage the applicants to go into the NRMP results at the end of each match and see what happened the year before uh, in terms of the applicants. And for example, for neurosurgery, you can see that, you know, new spots open. We have about 200 people that match, 220 people that match in neurosurgery every year, and about 10 to 20 of them 
are internationals, um, okay, um, it, um, independent applicants. So you essentially always think about we're competing not for the 200 spots really, but for about 10 to 20 spots every year, okay? Mm -hmm. And I think it was about 50 uh, internationals that applied to neurosurgery just last year in 2000, um, uh, 2019, not 2020. Um, and, you know, as many people know, the more interviews you get and the higher the score, they have some very nice graphs that show kind of the relationship between those numbers and with the success of matching into, you know, neurosurgery or another competitive specialty with the numbers never reaching 100%, of course. Um, but essentially that's the first pathway. The first pathway is to do research after, you know, you're done with school. And the reason for this is because you want to build your CV, it's because you want to show your, you know, all like all programs in neurosurgery are academic programs. So that means they're affiliated with a university. And so all of them, you know, value research a lot and an academic kind of mindset, um, whether you want to, you know, be an academic surgeon at the end. Uh, but I, I do think they value that. Um, and also for you may, to make connections, to go to the conferences. I will talk more about this. The second pathway is that some people do is they apply straight out of med school. So I've seen that happening a few times. Some people, you know, did quite a few of electives and they applied straight out of med school. And so they had the letters from them elected from the clinical experience and they decided to apply. That's a little bit of a risky pathway. I've seen it, you know, working out very few times. Um, I, I don't think you're gonna get the same number of interviews that you're gonna get with other pathways. And so you're on the edge kind of, you know, you're not getting that many interviews so you don't know what your chances are. It may still happen, but I think it's a little bit more risky. Um, the third pathway is applying into a preliminary surgery program, okay? So you're trying to get essentially into the program as fast as possible after med school. And then you're like, okay, now I started my general, you know, surgery, rota you, know, uh, you know, preliminary surgery uh, residency. I'm going to, you know, try to build on my clinical skills. And in the meantime, I can, most programs have like a neuro, an elective surgery rotation. And so a lot of the applicants choose the neurosurgery department to rotate in and then to start making connections there. They start to get you know, know the people. And then they apply um, at the end of the preliminary surgery rotation with the hope that they will match into the neurosurgery program, probably most likely at the institution where they did the preliminary surgery. And so I've seen that happening. Um, I know a few examples. Um, and so that's something that can also work. And uh, you know that might be a good pathway for people who are not interested in research at all. Um, or for a people that, um, you know, they don't want to pursue uh, research uh, for financial reasons. Um, because as I'm going to come more talk about the, you know, kind of the nuances for uh, choosing the research pathway. Another pathway is people that have actually um, done residency back home. We have these people too, as you may know, Malki, that have done residency back in their countries. And then they decided to practice in the United States. And they, you know, they decide to do um, residency all over again here. Um, so we have those people. And then finally, we have people that pursue kind of like an advanced degree, for example, an MPH or a PhD, and then they decide to apply, which is kind of similar like the research pathway. So in terms of the research pathway, what I did was I made connections during my elective um, at Johns Hopkins. So I did a total of three electives as a medical student. I did one at Johns Hopkins, one at Mayo Clinic, at one at NYU. And during my time at the, um, Johns Hopkins, I met my uh, mentor, uh, Dr. Biden. He was a chief resident actually at that time. And then he told me he was going to Mayo to start as an, uh, you know, as his assistant professor, a new faculty. And so um, after I went, you know, I was done with the electives, I went back to medical school, I graduated, and then I moved to the United States in July of 2015. And then I did a total of, you know, I always had in my mind. And that's also another question that a lot of people are asking, which is how many years of research, right? What's the ideal time? And the answer is, I don't really, you know, I cannot tell for sure. I do think in my mind that one year is not enough, um, which essentially one year means that as soon as you start essentially your research, you know, um, fellowship, then after a few months you, you apply. And so that means you don't have enough papers. You, you know, the people you're going to ask your letters from may, may not know you very well. Um, and I do think that the chances are that most likely, I think you may not match. I'm not saying it's not feasible, but I think in my mind, again, the statistics say that you probably need to spend two years in research and perhaps a total of three years till you start residency, like I did um, uh, before you start, um, you know. So probably I would say, you know, have a, a mind for two years, um, okay? So that was, you know, kind of what I was set on. 
and then I moved to you know to Rochester as I said in July of 2015 and I started you know doing research uh, with Dr. Biden and so I did a total of two years and then I applied um, and I was fortunate enough to match at, at the Mayo Clinic uh, where I am right now. That brings us to the end of this episode. Dr. Panos, I would like to thank you so much for this information. And in the next episode, we'll talk about Dr. Panos' research experience, which is one of the most important thing when matching into competitive specialties. Make sure to subscribe to the channel so you don't miss the next episode or any future videos related to residency, the match, and research. If you find any value in this video, make sure to hit the like button and share the video with your friends and colleagues so you can help the channel grow and help me continue doing videos like this to help you through your residency journey. If you have any questions, you can leave them in the comments below and feel free to reach out to me on Instagram or Twitter at Malki Asad or on my Facebook page, Malki Asad MD. Thank you all so much for watching and see you in future videos.